Welcome. In the name of Jesus Christ and on behalf of Bethel Church, I would like to welcome all of you to this virtual service of worship on this, the first Sunday in Advent. Uh, due to the COVID-19 uh, situation, we are not able to worship in person uh, this week, and so it is our, our pleasure uh, to uh, bring to you uh, this virtual worship via YouTube. And we just hope that you will find what we do and say in the context of, of this time to be both inspirational uh, and faith affirming. With that having been said, may I offer a, a prayer of invocation. Let us pray. Well, come Holy Spirit, be present here with us and, and among us and bring the expectation of that Christ child into our midst. May we wait patiently, but wait eagerly for the blessed occasion of your arrival, the arrival of your dear son, Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. The Advent wreath is a circle with no beginning and no end. It is a symbol of God's unending love and faithfulness. The prophet Isaiah said, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and he will be called Emmanuel. We rejoice that we too have found favor with God. God's mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. Let's continue in the spirit of worship as we read responsively these beautiful words from the 80th Psalm. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. But let your hand be upon the one at your right hand, the one whom you made strong for yourself. Then we will never turn back from you. Give us life and we will call on your name. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Amen.
If there are any uh, children in the room watching the worship video with you today, ask them to uh, come up and pay close attention. I have a message intended especially for them. Guys, I wanted to ask you today, did you have a good Thanksgiving? Raise your hand or jump up if you had a good Thanksgiving this year. You know, for me, I had a very good Thanksgiving. And, you know, come to think about it, I always have a good Thanksgiving, although I must confess there have been a couple where the turkey got a little overdone. But apart from that, Thanksgiving is one of those holidays that just can't go wrong. You know, sometimes other holidays or special days can be sometimes disappointing. You're looking forward to something and it doesn't quite live up to your expectations. Like with Halloween, for example, you may not like your costume or you may not get a chance like we did this year to go out uh, uh, trick-or-treating and get a bag full of candy. Or when it comes to your birthday, perhaps one of your best friends is unable to attend your party, and it's a bit of a, a letdown for you, isn't it? But you know, when it comes to Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving remains a day with little chance of going wrong or, or disappointing us. And the reason I think that is, is because Thanksgiving is all about gratitude. It's about being thankful for the blessings that we so much enjoy. And you know what? When you're thankful for the things that you do have, there's far less chance that you'll be worried or concerned about the things that you don't have. It's what sometimes is referred to as an attitude of gratitude. It's a way of thinking that, that helps you to be satisfied. It's a, a way of, of living that helps you to be happy, to have a, a good outlook. So remember, guys, don't waste your time thinking about or worrying about what you don't have. Instead, spend your time being grateful for what you do have. Because when you do, you'll grow closer day by day into the child that God created you to be. And that is indeed a very, very good thing. Would you pray with me, please? Dear God, help me to always be grateful, thankful for the many blessings that I have, the kind of blessings that I enjoy, chief among which is the gift of your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our first lesson comes from Isaiah chapter 64, verse 1 through 9. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down. The mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you, who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you were angry, and we sinned. Because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of your iniquity. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O oh Lord and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. Let's take this opportunity to offer to God this our prayer of confession. Let us pray. God of salvation. In, in Christ, Christ you have, have done, done great, great things. things. Salvation, salvation is, is your, your gift, gift to us. us. 
but we confess that often we try to replace your gifts with our own efforts. We try to complete what is already perfect. We try to add to what is already full. We try to earn what we already have. Forgive us for our foolishness. Help us to focus on your grace. Help us to live grateful lives in return. For Jesus' sake alone, amen. May those thoughts be continued in the silence of each of your hearts. Friends, hear the good news. God came to us because we were unable to reach God. Rest assured, in the person of Jesus Christ, in that tender Christ child, we are a forgiven people. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our second lesson comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 through 10. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will always strengthen you to the end, so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you of all of you be in agreement and that there be no division among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. Would you join your heart with mine as we turn together to God in prayer? Let us pray. O oh, gracious God, may this time of reflection on these words of ancient scripture help them to find new meaning and new purpose in our modern day lives. May we be informed, may we be encouraged, and may we be set forth with these words in our heart to help to govern the days and weeks ahead. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, needless to say, it's that time of year again the time for sending cards of greetings to one another, the time for shopping, for presents, for family and friends. And it's also the time for watching and re-watching your favorite holiday movies. Especially this year when we're not as likely to be traveling very far from home. Watching the holiday classics will be more popular, I think, than ever. From films like It's a Wonderful Life to Charlie Brown's Christmas, from The Polar Express to The Grinch Who Stole Christmas and everything in between. We'll spend many a, a happy hour in the coming weeks with our eyes glued to the television screen. You know, one Christmas movie that the Buckholtz household will likely watch again this year is Home Alone. You remember it, don't you? The 1990 holiday classic starring uh, Macaulay Culkin as Kevin McAllister, an eight-year-old boy left behind in the wake of his family's rush to catch their vacation flight to Paris. Young Kevin was being punished, as you'll recall, for bad behavior, and he had to, to spend the night away in his uh, attic uh, bedroom. And all the while that he spent that time, he was bemoaning the fact that he was treated unfairly by his family. 
so much so that he wished he could be rid of the whole bunch and live his life on his own terms. Well, much to his chagrin, his dreams come true as he wakes up to an empty house and, and realizes that he is indeed home alone. Without flinching, Kevin goes about, the, about making the most of his situation and his independence. He eats massive bowls of ice cream and stays up past his bedtime watching forbidden crime shows on TV. Clever beyond his years, Kevin is even able to thwart the attempts of two bungling burglars bent on robbing the McAllister household. But in the end, all Kevin really wants is for his family to return, and despite their flaws, to be back together again. Being home alone turned out for Kevin not to be as wonderful as he imagined it to be. Well, you know, in Hollywood terms, our scripture today from the 64th chapter of the book of Isaiah could indeed be a, a suitable prequel for Home Alone. Because just like Kevin McAllister, the people of Israel wake up one day to discover that they are home, but also very much alone. It's a time in Israel's history just after their exile to Babylon. King Cyrus of Persia has defeated the Babylonian army and, and granted permission for the Jewish people, the exiled people, to return to their native homeland. But once they get there, they soon discover that things are not the same as when they left. Most notably, the God of their creation, the God of their ancestors, seems nowhere to be found. They've been left to fend for themselves, or so it seems, and their newfound independence is not all that it's cracked up to be. They find themselves mired in their sin with no clear path to its resolution. But instead of looking within, the people look without and they, they blame God for their predicament, speculating somehow it is God's fault by his divine absence that has caused the people to multiply their sins. But just as in our Hollywood or holiday movie, resolution is in the offing. For despite God distancing God's self from their trouble and turmoil, their relationship with God hasn't been severed. With tenderness and love, the prophet declares on behalf of the Jewish people God's enduring faithfulness when he says, Yet, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay and you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. We are all your people. Well, this Sunday marks as you know, the beginning of the season of Advent. The four weeks that each year lead up to Christmas, it's a, a time for us, a time of hopeful expectation, of, of preparing to not only celebrate the birth of Christ, of Christ that happened so long ago, but also to prepare ourselves for the day of Christ's return. In the meantime, in the time of our contemporary living, it's easy to be fooled into thinking we are, in essence, you and I, home alone. That God has withdrawn God's self from our midst and remains aloof until some future day of revelation. It's awfully easy to blame God for our mistakes and for what we're currently going through. And that somehow, if God were on site, none of this would be happening. COVID-19 would have been eliminated months ago, and our individual lives, as well as our mutual economy, would have long since returned to normal. But of course, that isn't the case. We remain bogged down by COVID-19, stymied by a virus of epidemic proportion, 
one that has literally changed the way we live and, and work and play. And so we pray like the ancients prayed before us. Dear God, that you would tear open the heaven and, and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence. It was the lament of ancient Israel, and it is also the lament of modern-day America. As much as we enjoy our independence from God, it isn't worth it. We were fashioned at the dawn of creation to be creatures who depend upon God. And our secular separation from God, not to mention from each other, is just not consistent with our DNA. If it seems to you, as it does to me, that things aren't quite right, that our lives, both private and public, are, are off kilter and, and seemingly on a path towards destruction, I think that's because it's true. COVID-19 has brought into the foreground what's been going on for a long time in the background. Namely, uh, an exponential rise in our sense of, of self-sufficiency. And conversely, uh, a precipitous decline in our dependency upon God. We have been lulled into thinking that God has withdrawn God's self from our contemporary lives. When in fact, it is we ourselves who have done the withdrawing. Seminary professor Richard uh, Nicey, in his article entitled The Dark Side of God, puts it this way. Nicey writes, we think of God as an enhancement of basically a good life. We talk about what belief in God will add to our lives. And without God, we will lose out on certain benefits, but we rarely talk about the bleakness, even terror of life without God. Nicey continues by confessing that for us moderns, God's doing is restricted to the emotional arena. God does not alter our concrete situation. He only alters our attitudes. He says God eases our journey over the speed bumps of life, but does not fundamentally alter the road, or so we think. But now... Much like our ancient ancestors in the aftermath of exile, we too find ourselves living under an entirely new paradigm. We're being asked to rethink not only what we do and how we do it, but, but to a great degree to reconsider who we truly are, both as individuals and collectively as a church. COVID-19 has made life without God much less tolerable. No longer does a, a feel-good kind of God suffice. You and I need divine, present in a, divine presence in, in a very tangible way. We need divine intervention, the kind that will, as Isaiah suggests, make the mountains quake and, and the nations tremble, or in our case, make the coronavirus fall by the wayside and yield itself over to God's sovereignty and God's majesty. Which, you know, is a, a perfect segue into the season of Advent. Because that's exactly what this season is all about. It's about turning from self-indulgence and, and turning towards the promise of presence. Advent confesses that we simply cannot do this thing we call life all on our own. We need God with us, Emmanuel. In the person of that dear Christ child, God came, came, uh, came to assure us that we are not home alone. That God dwells not once removed in heaven above, but in the here and now, in the grit and in the grime of our day-to-day. -day. Even when it appears on the surface that God is nowhere to be found, Advent reminds us that's simply not the case, that the promise once fulfilled in a Bethlehem manger 
is now God's promise of expectation. The promise that God will again take up residence amid God's people and bring us peace. A peace that will endure against all odds, even the odds posed by a pandemic situation. So take heart, my friends. And may this Advent season find new relevance for each of us as individuals and for our church as a whole. May these coming days be ongoing reminders of God's eternal light, a light that once breached the gap between heaven and earth and will most assuredly do so again. I pray that it's so for you and for me. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's say our prayers. Eternal God, for whom all people wait and search, even when they don't realize it, we cry out today for a live and present word from you. As the season of Advent dawns upon us, we pray that you would speak to us in the graceful ways that you know best. Open our eyes that have been closed by fear and blinded by self-pity, that, that we may see you even in the anxieties and uncertainties that beset our days and threaten to overwhelm us in these uncertain times. Help us to see that amid the hustle and bustle of this holiday time, that you have and will become incarnate sanctifying the smallest tasks of love, generosity, and kindness that we are enabled by your grace to perform. We think of the needs of others in this season, O oh Lord, and we are embarrassed by our selfishness. May the answer to our prayers begin with our commitment to redeem our troubled times. Bring to all those who are in need the alleviation of their poverty or comfort. Enable us to do what we can to help them to share our own happiness and prosperity, to provide a listening ear or a friendly word, to do errands or acts of kindness. 
but let us not be content so long as conditions exist that foster human distress from generation to generation through the repetition of ignorance, filth, and disease. Dear Lord, we pray that the promise of your birth, that peace shall be on earth, that that peace may soon be fulfilled both in our troubled hearts and in our troubled world. Come to us, Lord, for we need your presence in our lives. And so this day we pray, especially for those dear to us who are sick or troubled or unsure or near the hour of their death. Comfort, comfort your people and fill each heart with your love. Through Jesus Christ, who is the joy of those who are happy and the comfort of those who mourn, as we join now in one voice to offer you this prayer by saying, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Friends, receive now these words of blessing and benediction. May God bless you and keep you. May God make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, let all of God's people at home say, Amen. Thank you for viewing this service of worship. If you've enjoyed or been touched by what you've seen today, please consider sharing this link to this video on your own social media that the good news of God's love can be reached to a broader audience. In addition, during this time of social isolation, we can still share a portion of our blessings as an expression of our gratitude to God. Please take a moment to fill out a check with a contribution that you can mail to Bethel Church. 
Please give generously as you are able.